Good morning, church, and welcome to this time of worship here at Rosenberg First United Methodist Church. My name is Jeremy. I'm the pastor here, and I'm grateful for your choice to be with us today as we seek to understand how the grace of God meets us at the intersection of faith and works. I want to share a couple of things going on in the life of the church before we get any farther. Uh, the first is an exciting update and a challenge. We've got uh, the update is that our sanctuary project is going to get underway on September the 13th. We officially signed the paperwork this week and worked out all the final details. Uh, you might remember we did some fundraising back toward the beginning of this year. Uh, between the freeze and some other things going on, we had to push that back just a little bit uh, to get our contractors back in a row and make sure we do the right project uh, that will be lasting for our future. Uh, so one of the things that we've done is we've, we've included changing out one of the air conditioning units. Uh, we previously intended to simply like, clean it off and take care of the ductwork that way. Uh, we've realized that this unit is probably 40 to 50 years old. Uh, the ductwork is not in insulated. So just all sorts of other problems arise because of that. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and take all of that stuff out. We're going to put insulated ductwork in, a brand new, more efficient unit. We're going to clean some uh, spots that are uh, around the front of the sanctuary but weren't included in our original project. Uh, so what all of, that, all of that amounts to is the excitement that September the 13th is our official start date. The challenge of this is that our final project is actually going to cost about $17,000 more than what we have raised so far. So I want to challenge you over the next three weeks, if you're able to donate to support this project, please let us know. You can click on the link there in the notes for the show. Uh, I did a little video walkthrough if you want to see a few more details about what's going on and what the work will be, um, the, what work will be done in the sanctuary. Uh, there's also a link to giving where you can click and just simply select the sanctuary project fund. That's the easiest way to donate to support this project. Of course, you can always let us know in the church office uh, if you want to send a check or drop that off or anything like that. But over the next three weeks, I want to encourage you to consider if you can support this project so that we can fully fund it. The trustees already have some backup plans in place. Uh, we've got a few uh, special uh, kind of project funds and uh, potential for a line of credit and all sorts of other things that we can do uh, if it comes down to it. But our strong preference would be to simply fundraise the rest of this over the next three weeks. That way we won't have to affect any other potential ministries or anything else going on in the life of the church. Uh, it's just really a, a vital project and I thank you for your generosity and for your patience so far. I want to encourage you to help us get over that finish line with another $17,000 here in the next three weeks. And then we'll certainly keep you updated as the work gets started and take some pictures and everything. Uh, we're excited to finally get this project going. I also want to mention that we have um, a, a delay to mention in an upcoming event. Uh, we did our pilot Wednesday night program back in July. Our intent was to launch a weekly Wednesday night event this fall uh, between uh, COVID cases rising and working out some of the logistics and the focus of that program. Uh, we decided to uh, delay that official launch uh, indefinitely right now. What we're looking to do is in October, November, and December, pick a Wednesday each of those months to do something of another trial run or another sort of um, exploration of what that Wednesday event might look like into the future. So keep an eye out for those dates, but thank you for everybody who came to that Wednesday night, our pilot run. Uh, it's definitely not something we're setting aside entirely. We simply want to focus on what we need to for right now so that we can make that event the best possible thing for our church's future in the long run. So uh, the last thing I want to mention is that we've got a couple of save the dates for Pumpkin Patch. September the 25th, that's a Saturday at 9 a.m. We're going to do a work day, and then October the 2nd at 9 a.m. as well, the pumpkins will arrive. So if you're interested and coming to those, mark those dates on your calendar. We'll be reaching out very soon uh, about slots to volunteer in the patch, to sell pumpkins, and all the other ways that you can support that amazing gateway into our community. Now, friends, I want to invite you to turn and focus our eyes and our hearts upon the Lord. I want to invite you to consider the ways that God has been faithful, that God's grace is active in us, and how that sends us out to do good works, to actively love each other in this world. So we're going to focus our hearts and our minds through this time of music. So let us worship our God today in spirit and in truth.
Friends, we come to the time in our service when we're invited to share with God all that is on our hearts and minds in prayer. I would first like to remind you that it is a communion Sunday. We'll post the video of our in-person communion service a little bit later this afternoon. That'll give you the opportunity to participate in that service together. But every time we do communion, it's a reminder that we are one body no matter where we are. So if you're at home right now watching this, if you're out of state, if you're across the country, wherever you might be, we simply want to remind you that this is the body of Christ and no amount of distance, no amount of separation can truly separate us from the love that binds our hearts together as one. This week, we also especially want to pray for all of those devastated by the recent hurricane uh, from Louisiana all the way up to New York. There are some very significant impacts of that storm. There are some ways that we can coordinate help between our local church and our uh, denomination. Uh, if you'd like to help, uh, whether that's a financial donation or perhaps going on a future work trip, uh, putting together flood buckets or that sort of thing, please reach out to us in the church office. There's a, a few ways that we can support the efforts going on right now, and so please let us know if you're interested in helping. Uh, we'd love to be able to help in that response because there's simply so much that help that is needed right now in response to those storms. And now, friends, I want to invite us to turn our hearts and our minds to our God in prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, fill us with your grace. Remind us of your presence, and in all things, God, strengthen us to do the great works that you have shown us in your life, death, and resurrection. God, today in all of our trials and struggles, through especially the tragedies and the uh, loss of life and property and everything that has happened through the storm, in response to each of those moments and in so many of the other challenges of our lives, remind us that you are the good shepherd and that you will be by our side through every deep valley. Strengthen our steps to love each other more and more. Strengthen us to remind each other that there is no journey we take alone, but you empower us to be by each other's side. And through your generosity, you model for us how we can give from the abundance we first received so in all our times of joy and celebration as well, let those good gifts not end with us, but let them overflow into the lives of our neighbors near and far. In all things, God, help us to give you the glory, to trust in you more and more each day, and to remember that there is no true separation between faith and works, but that in all of them you are alive, and you strengthen us to keep moving forward each day. So God, take up the joys and concerns of this congregation, all those prayers that are spoken and unspoken and those that only you know. Wrap them all in your arms of grace, and God, through everything, draw us closer to you. It's in your Son's name that we pray as we join in the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends, our primary scripture reading for the day comes from James chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, and then 14 through 17. Hear now the word of the Lord. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith? and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, Keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs. What is the good of faith? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, hide me behind your cross. 
so that it might be your word that is spoken this day, so that it might be your Holy Spirit that touches our lives and makes us new. Amen. Faith without works is dead. Works without faith are dumb. And by dumb, I don't mean to say that works without faith are a bad thing or that they're stupid or whatever other negative connotation you might bring with your, into your mind with that word dumb. I mean that word in a much more precise, almost clinical sense. I mean dumb as in unable to speak. Works without faith are dumb. They have no ability to speak or to convey anything in particular. We introduced the book of James last week by recognizing that this book has had a hard time in a lot of Christian communities, and it's had a hard time in part because it so clearly is emphatic that we must be doers of the word and not simply hearers. The focus on actually doing godly works makes some people uncomfortable. It might make them feel like the emphasis is to say that works are necessary to save you. Today we dive deeper into the heart of James's message to see that faith and works are not actually competing emphases at all. For James, both are two sides of the same coin. Faith without works is dead. Works without faith are dumb. Which is to say that faith without works have no power. Works without faith have no voice. James gets into the heart of the matter again in his intensely practical way in this reading from chapter 2. He says, If a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes comes in, which one do you take notice of? James's words cut right to the heart of those struggles that we still absolutely face in the church today. If you say to the one with fine clothes, Come, sit here, James continues, And then if you say to the poor person, stand over there or sit at my feet, if you do that, you've made distinctions. If you do that, you've become judges with evil thoughts. Ouch. I mean, I like to think that I've never intentionally or deliberately brushed someone aside because they are poor. But if I'm being honest, I have to admit that there is a greater level of comfort that I feel with someone who looks and talks and thinks and acts more like me. And I may not ever overtly say judgmental things around someone that I feel uncomfortable with based on how they look on the outside. But I cannot deny that those thoughts have crossed my mind based on the appearance of wealth. I know that those thoughts have crossed my mind, and I don't know that I've ever overtly done anything to intentionally treat people differently. I certainly can't deny that there are those thoughts that lead me in that direction. And James doesn't really have any easy words for us who make these all-too-human judgments, these snap decisions or these deep-seated ideas and approaches to how we treat people. To make distinctions in the first place, to make distinctions at all, to say to one, come sit here, and to say to the other, whether by words or by neglect or by simply ignoring them, sit over there, to make any such distinctions, to assess value, to lift someone up and put others down is to become judges with evil thoughts. For James, that is to take the role that God alone possesses. And I'd really like here at this point to wiggle my way out of discomfort. I'd like to convince you that I've never had such a thought in my life, but as I said, I'd be lying to say that. And it'd be nice and convenient to point out how many other people in the world are so much worse than me. It might be nice to point out how many other people there are who actually do incredibly hurtful things, who treat poor people as less than human, who treat them less worthy, who treat them as less valuable than the rich. There are plenty of people in this world who do that on purpose and intentionally. But if I were to play those comparison games, well, that's to undercut the entire message James is after. James doesn't give us that kind of wiggle room. To say, well, I didn't mean to do it, or to say that those other people are worse. He simply says to make distinctions at all is to act as a judge with evil thoughts. And when confronted with a way in which I fall short, I suspect like most people do, I love to minimize the relevance of a command to my life. I really hate to sit with that idea that I might actually be doing something wrong, especially when there's no quick or easy fix, especially when there's no simple correctable action that I can take care of and move on. 
I'd rather pretend like the command doesn't apply to me than admit, admit there's no easy way to correct what I'm doing. It's like when Jesus says in Luke's gospel, Jesus says very clearly, sell all that you have and give that money to the poor. And there are a hundred reasons to think that I'm not actually supposed to do that. I might think Jesus meant that we're supposed to be willing to do it, but of course we don't actually have to sell all that we have. I might be able to think maybe this only applies to that one first person to whom Jesus explicitly said it, and maybe it only applies to that person for reasons that are not told in Scripture. I might think to myself that maybe the economy is so different today that we'd actually be hurting the poor if we all did what Jesus said. If we all gave away and sold everything we had, we'd actually be hurting the poor because we'd crash the economy around us. So maybe that's a way we can slip out and get around these words of Jesus. It's really quite easy to figure out the ways in which the most challenging commands of the Bible, well, they don't actually apply to us personally. It's easy to figure out why they don't really mean what they seem to mean at face value. We can play those mental gymnastics all we want. It's a whole lot harder to sit with the reality that we all fall short. It's harder to sit with the fact that maybe the Bible does actually mean what it says to us. And what James has to say is quite the challenge. He tells us, has God not chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? And then as James continues on, he doesn't pull back. He doesn't offer an easier standard to live up to. He continues to double down on the value of the poor. And he says, not only must we treat all people as equal in every way, it's not simply that we must treat them equally. He claims that God has actually chosen those who are poor in this world to be rich in faith, to be the heirs of the promised kingdom. To be poor in this world is not just value neutral for James. It actually sounds very much like a benefit in James' own words. He tells his audience, the rich are the ones who oppress you. The rich are the ones who drag you into court and who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you. In other words, the rich are the ones who are responsible for every bit of persecution faced by the church in which James's message was heard. The rich are the ones who are pushing their fellow followers of God to abandon the gospel to which they have dedicated their lives. The rich are the ones pushing you away. The poor are the ones who have received the promise of new life. It's not even just that these two are equal in James's eyes. There's a value judgment made. The rich are the ones who push you away. The poor are the ones who are evidence of the promise of God. I don't really know about you, but as a middle-class white American, I think that kind of message is always going to make me quite uncomfortable. There are moments when reading scriptures like this one today when I suddenly feel guilty for even getting a paycheck because wealth does sound so inherently wicked. And I can't think that's what is really meant by James. It's so hard to think that that might even be remotely close to what James is really saying because then I find myself wondering if this is just a way out. I find myself wondering if all I'm looking for is a way to prove the scripture doesn't really apply to me, or at least if it does apply to me, then at least I'm not as bad as those other people. It's so hard to sit with the notion for even a second that the Bible might really simply mean what it says and say what it means. I'd really like instead to get myself out of any sense of guilt here, but James sure isn't going to be the one to offer an easy way out. James closes our reading for today with one of the most recognizable quotes in Scripture. He says, what, is, what good is it to you to say to your neighbor, go in peace, if they have come to you hungry? Faith won't fill a stomach. Words alone won't put a roof over someone's head. So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. There's very little wiggle room for reinterpreting what James is saying here. If someone needs clothes, give them clothing. If someone is hungry, feed them. If someone needs help, help them. Don't just say, you have faith. Show it by your works. And if you can't show your faith by your works, then your faith is dead. 
It's not that your faith is weak. It's not that it's asleep. It's not that it's lacking. It's that your faith is dead, in James' own words. I cannot think of a more harsh or emphatic way to make this very point. And as much as I'd love it, both pastorally and personally, in order to tell you that you've done far more than enough already, as much as I'd love to, t- to say that James is only for all those other people who don't do as much as we do, as much as I'd love to let us off the hook immediately, I really can't do it that easily. James gives a message that makes us uneasy. And we shouldn't be afraid to sit with that discomfort for a little while. Because that discomfort quite often tells us that we're starting to get to the true heart of the gospel message. James tells us faith without works is dead. We can also see that works without faith are dumb. Only when we experience the intersection of faith and works will we find a way to navigate through the most challenging messages of James. It's at this intersection of faith and works where we find the most important aspects of godly living. We find that the most important things are not about how much money I make or about how much money I give away. The most important question to ask is what do the things I do say about the God that I follow? What do all the things that I do say about the God that I follow? Whether we like the responsibility or not, our actions profoundly shape what others will hear of the gospel message. For James, the most significant and effective aspect of the gospel is that God has acted on our behalf. And because God acted on our behalf, therefore we ought to also act on the behalf of others. God is the one who is first never content to sit back. God is never content to sit back and watch the rich get richer and the poor get forgotten. Christ came to challenge every system of power and every assumption that valued people by the size of their wealth or by the reach of their influence. And now what we do will either participate in spreading this good news to the world or it will hinder it. We'll either reinforce the message of the gospel of our God or we'll get in its way by the things we do. When Jesus came to live and to minister with us, He never shied away from the poor at all. Plenty of times, he ignored the customs of his day even. He ignored the expectations of his people so that he could go and eat with the least, the last, and the lost. In Jesus' own words, the first will be last, and the last will be first. In Paul's tirade against the Corinthian church, when he wrote that letter that we find preserved in 1 Corinthians, in that letter Paul says, that they have blasphemed the body of the Lord by taking communion while the rich are allowed to feast in the inner sanctum and while the poor stay out on the porch. Overcoming this boundary between the rich and the poor is no small point at all in Scripture. It's one of the central ways in which God challenges our notions of normalcy, in which God shows us a kingdom kind of life, a different kind of kingdom with a very different sort of king. And I don't know how to get us out of feeling a little discomfort with James's challenging and very clear-cut, simple message. But I do take joy in the fact that we are not alone. I take comfort in knowing that the grace of God is more than enough. I find hope in the fact that Christ will be faithful until the kingdom comes, even if I am not. Faith that is alive and well can't help but empower us to go out. It can't help but send us out and inspire us to do practical, concrete things for our neighbors near and far. And it sends us out not because we have enough faith to do it on our own, but because God is here in this place and God continues to push us on toward each other. God continues to sustain us with each step that we take. A life that is guided by faith in what God has done Well, that's a life that can't help but speak about the greater life God desires for us to know. That greater life God empowers for us to live even here, even now. In its most concrete form, what that means is realizing that we all have gifts to bring to the table. Like we said a few weeks back when we started looking at God's abundance, we said that our calling as Christians is to use the gifts we have. Not to use the gifts we wish we had or the ones that we assume would be better than the ones we actually have. 
our call is to use the gifts we have. Because you see, it's not the case that we're supposed to fix the whole world with our actions. It's not true that we in the church have what the world needs and that those people across the street will only ever be the recipient of all that we have to offer. That's not the way this works. The truth is that all of our lives are better. All of our lives are more holy and faithful and good when all our gifts are brought to the table. It is equally important to do good things and also to give voice to the gifts of the people who are often forgotten to those who are ignored, to those who are even pushed down by the way our world works. Faith without works is dead. Works without faith are dumb. Faith without works have no power. Works without faith have no voice. In the communion meal, we see that we're invited to experience the intersection of faith and works. It is this communion meal, this sacrament that we celebrate each month that provides that clearest lens to see this intersection. Because what we do in the sacrament is invite all people to come to the table of grace and there to be met by the presence of our God. Our faith tells us that no matter how unworthy we feel, no matter how much we have to offer in return, what matters is the grace of God that goes before us. What matters is the grace of God that gives us hope and assurance that gives us sustenance for the journey of head. Taking this bread and this juice, we come forward in faith to tell the world that we're not good enough on our own. We come forward in faith to tell the world that we don't have all that is needed to fix the world's problems. But through Christ, we can trust that we are more than enough. Through Christ, we can speak this good news that changes everything. Through Christ, Our lives can start to share the heart of God and meeting each other at the level of our most basic needs. Because through Christ there is hope and there is joy and there is transformation and there is abundance that is more than enough for all. I could tell you that it doesn't matter how much you do. And I could say that we're already doing enough good in order to carry our part of the workload. But to even start by focusing on our role and our faithfulness in this process is to miss the entire point of James's message. We're invited to seek to know the living Lord. We're empowered by him to live a life that proclaims the gospel. When God is alive in us, our lives begin to speak the gospel louder than words. James should make us uncomfortable. But James should make us uncomfortable, not because we fall short, but because there is so much more possible whenever we can get ourselves out of the way. It should make us uncomfortable because it challenges us to set aside our values and our assumptions and our priorities about the way the world ought to work and to instead focus on God's kingdom come, to instead focus on the life that God makes possible, not the ones that we'd rather build for ourselves. It challenges us to see that our lives are better when all God's children are seen and known and when all God's children find their place in this community that we share. We're called to look for the Spirit of God to empower a living faith. We're called to let our lives speak the gospel with every action that we take because at the intersection of faith and works, God changes everything. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh, how could it be that my God would welcome me into this mystery so take this bread take this wine now the simple may divine for any to receive by your mercy we come to your table by your grace you are making us faithful lord we remember you and remembrance leads us to worship and as we worship We 
Lord, we remember you And remembrance leads us to worship And as we worship you Our worship leads to communion We respond to your invitation We remember you Dying you destroyed our death Rising you restore our life Lord Jesus come in glory Lord Jesus come in glory Dying you destroyed our death Rising you restored our life Lord Jesus come in glory Lord Jesus come in glory Lord Jesus, come in glory. By your mercy we come to your table. By your grace you are making us faithful. Lord, we remember you. And remember And as we worship you, our worship leads to communion. We respond to your invitation. We respond to your invitation. We remember you. Well, friends, this brings us to the end of another time of worship together. Don't forget, if you're able to support our sanctuary project, we'd be grateful for your further generosity. There are links there in the show notes, both to see a video update of the work, uh, and then also where you can go to give directly to that project. In the next three weeks, we're hoping to raise an additional $17,000 so we can fully fund the project without affecting any other ministries of the church. Uh, and also, don't, remember, don't forget that uh, September the 25th at 9 a.m., we've got our pumpkin patch uh, work day, and then Sept uh, October the 2nd at 9 a.m., the pumpkin will arrive. October is just around the corner. Now, friends, receive these words as your benediction. Friends, go forth in the grace and the love of our God, knowing that God is with us, knowing that God is always by our side, and knowing that God's grace enables us to do even greater things than these. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen and amen.